turn it over to Mike Boots, who's going to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Michael. So it's a great pleasure to introduce <coughs> Ben. So Ben is a mathematician originally with his maths degree in Warwick University in the UK. Those of you don't know, actually, Warwick University is one of the top universities in the UK, even though it was started in the 1960s, built in the middle of the industrial heartland of the UK that then sort of collapsed around it, and yet it has maintained itself as this really top university. And, and the kind of the story, which may or may not be apocryphal, is that the original vice chancellor was set up this new university. How do you make a university a really great university? It's like, you want mathematicians. That's the key thing. That's the most intellectual thing. So apparently he went to Cambridge. So we're the best mathematicians. They're in Cambridge and applied maths. So he went to the Cambridge Maths Department and knocked on people's doors and said, are you happy here? We're going to build you a whole university at Warwick. So they had this fantastic maths department that generated then. And then Ben thought, well, I want to work in math biology, so I should go to a biology department. And he cho chose Oxford Zoology for that, so maybe that's okay, no reasonable department. <laughs> and there he worked with Sinetra Gupta, Angus Bucklin mainly, uh, doing a bunch of theory on co-evolution of hosts and parasites. And after that he joined uh, my lab as a postdoc, came here as a postdoc, to work with me on co-evolution of hosts and parasites. And then, unfortunately, well, fortunately, he got a NERC advanced fellowship. And for people who are interested in potentially having an academic career in the UK, you should probably come and talk to us about these things. These are fantastic um, um, route into a faculty job that the UK has, where you basically have five years where you're paid for, your research is funded, you can take it anywhere, and Ben took it to Bath University, who then have given him a prolective position. So you get five years of pure research, and then you go into a full-time job. So he got that position and was like, well, I have to leave Berkeley. Then he was like, gee, we kind of like Berkeley quite a lot. So he decided to stay on for a couple of years, which he was allowed to do this to stay in the group. He works in our lab a bit with us on co-evolution of hosts and powers. But today he's going to talk to you about something different, which came out of his PhD work in Oxford. We worked with, I guess, Sinetra Gupta, but, but also, I guess, with Kevin Foster in particular, uh, about some theory he's done on niche theory, which is very appropriate for a talk here. So, okay. thanks, uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Mike, and thanks for the invite to come and speak today. Um, this is actually my first time coming to one of the MBZ seminars, um, but I look forward to coming to many more in the future. And as you've just heard today, I thought I'd talk about something that's uh, actually to do with my main line of research, which is focused on post-parasite interactions and trying to understand our ecology and evolution. Instead, I thought I'd talk about something that I'm not an expert in, and uh, that's about niche theory. And for me, I, I thought this would be an interesting topic to talk about, one because of the history of the MBZ, um, and because I've done a little bit of theory in this recently. Uh, and because niche is one of those things that is central to so many questions in both ecology and evolution. How does competition affect species coexistence? Does competition drive patterns of diversity? Or is it down to more neutral processes? If competition does drive patterns of diversity, what should those patterns look like? Can we tell anything from simple mathematical models? Uh, do we expect uh, species to occupy every potential niche that's available, or should there be niches left unoccupied? If so, why are they left unoccupied? What drives these patterns of diversity? And so these are the sorts of questions that have obviously interested lots of ecologists and evolutionary biologists for many decades, and a big part of the development of this theory has been the use of these simple mathematical models to understand these general patterns that we're likely to see. So to give a bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to spend some time, because this is quite a, a big concept, uh, to talk about the history of how niche has developed as a concept and how the theory developed, particularly during the earlier part of the 20th century. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the simple models that we use. So how do we understand uh, the link between competition, niche, and patterns of diversity? In particular, focusing on an important distinction between when modeling just one type of resource and one when looking at multiple types of resources. And I'm going to talk about the implications of this, what, what it means for these general patterns of diversity, and then finally talk about some data. Does it actually link up with anything we see in reality, or is this just some theoretical construct of someone in an ivory tower? Uh, 
Um, so, like I said, I'm going to talk about a bit of the history of Nietzsche, and the reason is not to try to impart a history lesson, um, but because the history of Nietzsche is quite messy, I think it's fair to say, it's one of those areas, if you look at the literature, where it's, uh, there's lots of definitions thrown around, and it tends to receive a bit of mixed press. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Nietzsche concept remains one of the most confusing and yet important topics in ecology, that's pretty fair. Uh, no concept in ecology has been more variously defined or more universally confused than niche. Again, that seems pretty fair. Uh, some people are less equivocal and say we should just avoid it whenever possible. Uh, that's a little bit harsh maybe, but I can understand the frustration. And a lot of that comes from the fact that there are so many different ways of talking about niche. We have things like the Grinnellian, the Eltonian, the Hutchinsonian niche. You've got niche packing, niche partitioning, niche overlap. You've got uh, N-dimensional hypervolumes and vacant niches and resource utilization functions. And I thought, so I thought it would be good to try and give a bit of an overview of how these things relate to one another and try and synthesize that. Uh, because when you look at the niche literature, it can sometimes be like two people talking about the same thing, uh, or appearing to talk about the same thing using the same term, but actually referring to very different things. And as a Brit living abroad, this is the kind of thing I tend to run into quite a lot. Um, even the way, even the word niche itself, um, I hope it doesn't offend an American ear because I'm not saying niche, um, but that, even that tiny difference just epitomizes the fact that there are so many differences within this field and it is quite messy even at the best of times. So let's go back and, and talk about how this all came to be. And although we tend to think of uh, evolution belonging to Darwin and the concept of niche as being very much a 20th century thing, this idea of each species having a relationship with the environment and with other species um, goes back way before the 20th century. So Darwin talked about each species having a line of life. And if you go back in religious texts, if you look in the Bible in Genesis, if you look at uh, Greek philosophers like Aristotle, they had this notion of uh, each species living in some sort of relationship with other species and with the environment, it's having its own niche, if you like. Uh, but of course it was Darwin that gave us <coughs> evolution and the idea of adaptive radiation, so how do we um, generate these patterns of diversity? So Darwin's finches remain a classic example of this, of course, and in the Voyage of the Beagle he said one might uh, really fancy from the original paucity of birds in this archipelago, by which he means the Galapagos Islands, one species have been taken and modified for different ends. In other words, these species have evolved to occupy distinct niches. So of course that term niche didn't <coughs> exist at the time, and it was Joseph Grinnell of MBZ fame, who uh, is accredited with really popularizing that term in a way that we would recognize today. So to Grinnell, the niche was essentially a combination of all abiotic and biotic factors that contribute to both the persistence and the regulation of a species. So think of things like temperature, pH, um, as well as food sources, nest sites, um, the impact of predators, mutualists, and so on. All of these things combining together. But crucially to Grinnell, the niche was a property of the environment, and he used this to look at ecological equivalence between environments. So you'd have the same niche in different places, potentially occupied by the same species, or different species, or left under. So to Grinnell, at this relationship between the, the environment and the niche. And then came along Charles Elton, and he took it in a slightly different direction, downplaying the role of abiotic factors, instead thinking about the functional relationship between species. So he was thinking more about food webs and how species interact with one another. Again, so a slightly different angle on this, but again, the niche to him was a property of the environment. So apex predator would be one sort of functional niche that could be filled by different species or left vacant depending on the different environments. So though people downplay the, uh, the similarities between the Grinnellian and Eltonian takes on niche, there are also um, some similarities there. Then along came Locker and Volterra and their uh, competition and predation models, and then Gauss. And Gauss, of course, have gave us the competitive exclusion principle, or rather it's attributed to him, but Grinnell uh, talked about this much earlier. Uh, but this is really saying that if two species are competing for a shared resource, then in a constant environment, they're not going to be able to coexist indefinitely. 
In other words, if they're occupying the same niche, they're not going to be able to coexist indefinitely. So this starts to bring in ideas, again, more of, of a link, a stronger link between competition and niche. So if we fast forward a bit, we get to Hutchinson. And Hutchinson uh, proposed things in a, in a slightly different direction. He, he came up with this idea of an n-dimensional hypervolume. Uh, if you're not familiar with what a hypervolume is, uh, hypervolume is to volume as what volume is to area. It's just a higher dimensional way of thinking about volume. Uh, and if that sounds a bit, a, a bit abstract and hand wavy, it's because it kind of is. Uh, but to him, he thought of characterizing the environment, both abiotic and biotic factors, in terms of uh, dimensions. And so we'd have, say, food source, nest sites, variation on these things, temperature. And within that, you describe an area, a volume or hypervolume, uh, which would be all of the uh, conditions that would allow a species to persist and to, to grow. And in the absence of anything else, any other species, this would be its fundamental niche. If you have other species there, that volume could be reduced into a realized niche due to competition. Now, the key thing about Hutchinson really was this shift from, as opposed to Grinnell and Elton, thinking about the niche being a property of the environment, uh, the niche instead being a property of the species. And so that immediately throws up the problem of, well, can you even have a vacant niche? Does that even make any sense? Because if you need to have a species to define a niche, does it even make any sense to have an empty uh, but again, this kind of just goes to show the problems with this, the niche literature. Uh, even in the same infamous paper, his concluding remarks, uh, he said uh, the, the question raised by cases like this is whether the species fill all the available niches, or whether there really are empty niches. And the rapid spread of introduced species often gives evidence of empty niches. So he seems to have immediately contradicted his own definition in the very same paper. So I guess let's take stock at that point. We've had all of these fairly vague and abstract definitions of niche during the early parts of the 20th century. And they're all sort of, they have things in common, but they also have these subtle differences. And obviously while definitions matter to a certain extent, I think it's important to take a step back and try and uh, draw out the general principles across those things. And I think it's fair to say at first that the niche is an abstraction of reality. There is no n-dimensional hypervolume that exists in reality. These are just ways things we use to try and understand the natural world. Uh, and because of that, they're all going to be imperfect. There is no perfect way of thinking about these things. But it does, doesn't mean that we can't use them to try and understand something about nature. And more recent theory has talked about the niche being both environmental requirements, so things the species requires to persist, but also its impact on that environment. So we need to take into account both of these factors. And obviously it makes intuitive sense that if two species uh, occupy very distinct niches, we shouldn't expect them to be in competition with one another, whereas if they have very similar niches, they should be in competition. So there's, there's a general intuitive idea there um, that stands true. And this brings us to how do we then expect competition to drive patterns of diversity, the evolutionary ecology of niche. So what can niche theory tell us about patterns of diversity? That's the central question. So following Hutchinson, we have people like MacArthur and Levins and others who use these simple competition models to uh, draw links between uh, niche and competition and ultimately understand uh, patterns of diversity. How do we expect uh, niche to lead to uh, self-organization of species into communities? And they did this by drawing an equivalence between niches and things called resource utilization functions. So what do I mean by these things? So this is a, a simple competition model. So we have a species here uh, denoted by subscript i. And this is just saying how it changes its density or population size based on intra and intra specific competition. So this is its rate of change. It has things like a per capita growth rate, it has carrying capacity. And this factor here in the brackets just uh, reduces the growth rate according to the strength of intra and intra specific competition. Uh, and that comes in through this factor here. So that's the, the density of a particular species that it comes into contact with. And here is the strength of competition. It's this component here that's the key bit. This is how we're linking competition and niche together. So MacArthur and Levins came up with this idea of, OK, well, why don't we characterize the niche according to which resources a particular species uses? 
So we have these resource utilization functions here. And all of this equation, all this equation really here is, is doing the same k-work. We've got the resources used by species i and the resources used by species j. We just somehow measure their overlap. Think of their, the degree to which their area or volume overlaps. And then take that in relation to all the resources used by a particular species. And say, okay, the more similar these things are relative to the focal species, uh, the stronger competition should be. And that's essentially all it is to these, to these models. So what do I mean by these resource utilization functions? Well, they're essentially think of them as being a probability distribution, or something like that, to characterize which resources a particular species uses. So here we've got two species, I and J, and species I tends to prefer smaller seeds than the species J. That's all that's really saying there. And unsurprisingly, it's this bit here in the middle where their niches overlap. That's their niche overlap. Okay, that's, their, that's going to define their strength of competition. Now, although I've been talking about resources, and I'm going to continue using resources just for linguistic ease, uh, it's not anything particularly unique to resources. Okay? It's anything that can be involved in competition could be somehow mapped in this way. So we tend to think of uh, food sources and nest sites, um, but other things like parasites, predators, any other traits that might be involved in competition or cause divergence um, along a potential niche dimension could be used in this way. So when I say resources, think more generally regulated. Okay, so let's go through a few simple examples. Um, the first case, the simplest thing we can think of is what happens if you've just got one type of resource bearing in one characteristic. And this is the classic example um, from the theory in the sort of 60s and 70s. So let's go back to this example I had a few slides ago. We've got two species here, I and J. They each prefer a particular type of seed. This is their niche overlap here. And we can characterize their distributions based on things like their mean, set hats here, and some measure of their variance with the standard deviation here. So some measure of their niche breadth. And when you feed that back into that earlier equation from MacArthur and Levins to give you the strength of competition, this is the kind of thing you end up with. And all that really matters here is this difference here between their means. Okay? So all this is saying is that the strength of competition will increase when they're more similar. That's all this is. But when you, so when you model this and you allow these species to evolve, you allow their niches to evolve over time, uh, this leads to disruptive selection. So unsurprisingly, you're going to end up seeing these species tend to diverge. Okay? So this gives rise to ideas like limiting similarity and character displacement and so on. So the next interesting question that arises from that then is, okay, well, what happens if you allow multiple species? So more than two, what happens if we allow these species, uh, we allow speciation events to occur, we allow mutations, and so on? So if we run another simulation, allow species to start popping up over and over and over again, this is the kind of thing you end up seeing. So they move around to start with, and they eventually settle into this very regular pattern. And this is the really the classic result that came from all of that theory. The idea that competition leads the self-organization of species into this uh, very regular, very densely packed niche space, if you like. So they're segregating into these different specializations. So you've got one species here specializing on very small seeds, intermediate seeds, and so on, up, and so on, and so on. So although there's some niche overlap here, we can characterize them according to things like the, the distance between them is based on like their niche breadth. So that's the, like I said, the really classic example that's still taught in lots of undergraduate courses on ecology. The next logical stage that people thought about is, okay, what happens if we've got multiple dimensions in our niche space? Okay, so we haven't just got one axis that we're talking about, we're talking about many axes, many dimensions. So let's think of this in terms, first of all, what happens if you've got one resource varying in multiple characteristics? So seeds, say, don't just vary in size, they'll vary in color, species may show a preference for these things, they may vary in hardness, they may vary in shape, and so on. So all we've done here is we've just gone from one dimension to many dimensions in terms of our seeds. So what does this mean in terms of resource utilization functions and ultimately niche overlap and competition? <coughs> so again, if we've got these two things, we've got seed size, we've got seed color, we can describe 
each species by uh, a distribution on each axis. So a preference and a variation. And then the question is, how do we combine these things? Um, and it should make sense that if you've got a normal distribution on one axis, uh, which is just a univariate Gaussian, when you move to multiple axes, multiple dimensions, you just multiply those things together and you end up with a multivariate Gaussian. The univariate to multivariate, that should be fairly intuitive. Mathematically, if you're interested, all that's happening here is you're just indexing over each of those things that we had before, the differences in their means, and then you multiply them together. And this gives you your overall strength of competition. So if we run a simulation, again, we've got seed size, seed color on these axes. What, what do we end up seeing? So each of these dots, again, represents a niche. And you end up seeing something that's very similar to what you saw in that first case in one dimension. Okay, so it's highly analogous here. You've got a very densely packed niche space. We've got lots of species there. You have every potential combination. So if you discretize these things, you'd have every combination of seed size and seed color represented. And you have this very regular pattern. You have the same sort of distance between species, all of these sorts of things. So densely packed, very regular. So if we imagine now, what happens if you have different independent adaptive radiations? So imagine you've got different islands, and on each of those islands you seed them with a species, they're all otherwise identical, and then you come back 10 million years later, see what you see. And although the trajectories <coughs> might be different between those environments, the theory predicts that you're gonna end up with essentially the same niches filled on all those different environments. So even though these are ind independent adaptive radiations, because of this dense niche packing, uh, and these regular patterns that arise, you end up seeing the same outcomes in these environments. That's essentially where that sort of theory left off in the 60s and 70s, um, saying that if you've got competition, regardless of whether it's in one dimension or many dimensions, whether it's one resource or many resources, that you end up getting dense regular patterns of species. So we should expect to see all potential niches occupied in the environment. And that's essentially what that competition theory said. Uh, but that doesn't really make sense because my argument is that the single and multiple resources have to be treated differently. We can't treat them the same. The question is, does that then lead to very different patterns of diversity or not? Does this actually work? So of course, species don't just compete for one type of resource. They compete for things like food sources, nest sites, and so on. Um, so it does actually have some practical relevance in that sense. We don't just expect them to come for one type of thing. Um, and again, more generally regulating factors. The question is really, can you combine these things in a sensible manner, or to just multiply them together in that naive manner earlier? So what do I mean by that? Well, okay, let's go back to this, these distributions, kind of like we had before a few slides ago. Again, we can describe a species' uh, preference for a certain type of seed. We can describe its preference to nest at a certain height. The question is then, how do we combine those things? So the classical theory said, again, you've got univariate Gaussians in one dimension. You just multiply them together, and you've got multivariate Gaussians. And then mathematically, that kind of seems to make sense. And that's sort of where this misstep happens. I guess it's a cautionary tale of, of always making sure you, you're going back to the underlying biological processes when modeling something, because while something might make sense mathematically, it doesn't necessarily make sense biologically. Um, the reason that doesn't make sense, hopefully, should be kind of clear, because this is essentially saying that if you've got two species and one of them are identical, one of them diverges on the type of seed that it likes to feed on, then that's going to completely remove all competition. But obviously, it's, it's still competing with the nest sites. There's got to be some element of competition still there. So, my argument is it looks something a bit more like this. Uh, so rather than multiplying those independent uh, distributions together, you need to weight them and add them. And so all this kind of pattern here is saying is that no matter how much you diverge in one direction, say in terms of your seed size, that doesn't affect competition for the nest size. Again, this should be painfully obvious um, in many ways. And I'm kind of surprised that it wasn't picked up in that original theory, but it's, it's Sort of stood there for 40 odd years or so. Again, mathematically, what's happening, we're just increasing the indexing here. 
you're interested, so you characterize each resource type or regulating factor. You can multiply within those, but when you combine them, you need to weight them and add them together. And the reason you weight them is because in some cases, say, competition will be stronger for nest sites than it is for food resources. Okay, so I've made a big fuss about this distinction between single and multiple resources. Does it actually have any impact, any qualitative impact on the outcome? And hopefully it does, otherwise it would be a waste of my time. Uh, so, here we've got, again, we've got seed size, we've got nest site, this is another simulation, exactly the same kinds of environmental conditions, otherwise, and here, you see that each of the, the species have, have separated on both of these axes. So there's a sense of non-overlapping associations between these things, because they're not substituted. Uh, so one of the immediate things that should come out of this is, compared to the previous example of where we had these very dense, regular patterns of species, and lots of species there, uh, here we've got many fewer species than you'd expect if you just naively uh, totaled up or tied up all of the uh, different combinations of say, seed size and nest size. Okay, so there's no species here that prefers small seeds and nests at a low height, and so on. Uh, so, what that means here is that if you just, again, naively increase the, the number of axes in your niche space, uh, you go from, say, one here to three. If you've got <coughs> substitutable resources, you expect this explosion in, in diversity, this exponential increase in species richness, uh, whereas if they're non-substitutable, you expect things to basically stay flat. And the reason is because you've opened up new avenues of competition rather than actually increasing the resources that are available to species. That's kind of, uh, it's kind of nice in a way, but it's, it's not that groundbreaking in other ways. To me, something that's a bit more interesting is the repeatability. So here, if you remember before, I talked about adaptive radiations in different islands, the same initial conditions. Here, if we just run it again, don't change anything else, it's just stochasticity here, it has ended up with very different species associations, different associations between these axes. So what this is saying here is that, again, we've got a very sparsely filled niche space, we've got non-overlapping associations, but when we run it again, we get different results. So let's run it one more time. And again, we see these different evolutionary trajectories and then different endpoints. Now, we can keep running those over and over again and end up seeing the same kind of outcome. Each different adaptive radiations lead to different species. In to me, this is kind of interesting because what it's saying is that if you were to take identical environments, seed them with the same species, come back 10 million years later and, and see what species are there, you're going to end up seeing, or you're likely to end up seeing very different things. And even though you have got different species, different associations in those environments, it's not necessarily because there's something intrinsically different about those environments. Simply stochasticity can be reinforced, um, competition can reinforce the effects of stochasticity and lead to very different outcomes. So this tells you that there doesn't necessarily have to be, or just because you see different types of associations in different environments, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a difference in the environments. This can be purely due to um, its effects having competition between multiple resources. So just to, to re-emphasize what I'm saying there is, if you say we've got two types of seed size, two types of nest types, we've got uh, two locations here, you'd end up seeing, say, this association in one environment and this association in another environment. And crucially, once these things are established, they're stable. So you can't just, say, chuck a species in here and assume that it's going to be able to invade, even though it's able to coexist in this environment. It has to be intrinsically fitter than these other species in, it in order to be able to invade. Mm. So the crucial, pattern, the, the crucial question then is really, do, do these patterns actually exist in nature? Are these just theoretical curiosities, or do they represent something in reality? Do they have any explanatory or predictive power? So let's go through some, some data. And I guess the classic example, uh, other than Darwin's finches, of patterns of diversity and niche convergence and, and so on, are anolis lizards. Uh, 
and we can characterize them according to different things. People talk about them in terms of their ecomorphs. So if you're not familiar with this, this is roughly a characterization of uh, both morphological and behavioral traits, the structural habitat, and so on. Uh, it's a composite measure, so it's not really perfect um, for these purposes, uh, but it will suffice for now. And let's combine something completely different, their dewlaps. Again, dewlaps is a, are a bit of a weird thing uh, to, to think about in terms of uh, mapping onto these resource utilization functions, niche dimensions, but they're thought to be involved in species recognition, so you'd expect to see uh, fitness effects, or detriments, if two species have similar um, <coughs> dewlaps. So if we look at data from the Greater Antilles, here we've got Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico, and each of these rows correspond to different ecomorphs in the columns to uh, different dewlaps. And I think there are a few things that can be taken away from this. First of all, this naive idea that uh, all possible combinations will be generated doesn't really exist, right? These are very sparsely packed niche spaces. They're not densely packed like the sort of original naive prediction. Uh, in terms of non-overlapping associations, well, in terms of ecomorphs, if we look at Cuba, for example, five out of the six ecomorphs are, are non-overlapping. There's just one type in each. Um, but then we've got this case here. So we've got quite a lot of overlap in terms of this ecomorph. What could be causing that? Well, it could be down to the fact that ecomorph is this imperfect composite measure. It, there is no sort of comp competition for an ecomorph, you're competing for other things, and characterizes many things. If we think about dewlaps, we see very few overlaps. In fact, there's only one overlap down here in Puerto Rico. Uh, again, that seems to be consistent with the modeling, but there are lots of ways to generate dewlaps. So although it seems to be consistent at first, this could also just be down to chance. So I guess it's important to, to make sure uh, you know what are the underlying processes that can generate these things. So while it's consistent in, in broad terms, it's not the only explanation. And finally, in terms of arbitrary associations, if we look at here, in Cuba there's this guy that's got this yellow dewlap and this type of ecomorph here. Uh, and in Jamaica we've got a yellow dewlap with a different type of ecomorph. So again, it's at least consistent with this idea that we'd have arbitrary associations between traits in different environments. And that should also make sense. There's no reason a priori to think that a particular ecomorph should be associated with a particular type of dew. But I think it's over fair to say that the data are imperfect. So let's look at another example. Here we've got data on native and invasive bumblebees, and the study is characterized according to their nest site and their foraging sites. Uh, you can also characterize them according to their proboscis length, so um, in terms of which flowers they'll actually be feeding on in those environments. So there's a bit more data here in terms of how we can separate things. But again, we see some aspects of the modeling and some aspects that don't agree with it. So in terms of uh, nest sites, Diversus tessatus here, Spomus diversus tessatus, and Hippocrates saparensis, they seem to overlap on nest sites. There's only one nest site here for this species, so the data aren't great. There seems to be an overlap here that doesn't really sit theory. It's not clear why that's the case. In terms of uh, foraging sites, these two overlap here, but their proboscis lengths aren't actually quite the same. So it seems to be that there is some niche overlap here, but it's not, uh, not total. It also seems to be in this system there's quite an abundance of flowers. So if we go back to those ideas of weighting competition, we should expect the competition for flowers should be weaker for even competition for nest sites. The interesting thing is what happens if you introduce uh, Bombus terrestris, so it's invasive to Japan, and it sits down here in this right, bottom right quadrant. So it overlaps with uh, Hippocritus saparensis for both flower sources and nest sites, and accordingly, that species has suffered severe declines. Uh, it overlaps with Diversus tessatus in terms of nest sites, and that's also experienced some declines. This species up here, hasn't experienced any declines, even though there is a certain degree of overlap in terms of their flower sites. So, again, this might be because there's not a complete overlap. It might be because flowers don't seem to be particularly limiting in this system. Uh, 
but in other systems it's known, or in other populations, it's known that flowers can be very limiting and can have an effect on uh, competition. So it's likely that if those flowers do become more limiting, we'd expect competition to occur between these species. We'd expect that competition to increase. This also tells us that over the long term, we'd expect a species up here to be the only one that could coexist with one of these terrestrials. So again, overall, these data, they're kind of uh, imperfect, for example, because of the fact that there's only one nest site for this species down here. It was detected during the study. Uh, and it just kind of goes to show that a lot of the ecological data out there combining multiple niches and looking at their overlaps is actually really poor. Uh, it's very difficult to try and find data on these things that's, that's reliable and characterizes them well. I was kind of expecting when I went out there to see this wealth of data, uh, but it's not really the case. So let's look at some genetic data and said, see if there's anything there. Well, so this is whole genome multilucus sequence typing of uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, bacterium. Here we've got uh, different sequence types. So think of this as, say, different uptake pathways and so on. Uh, so different specializations in terms of iron and sodium pathways. So here, this looks a lot more in line with what I was talking about earlier. We've got these very sparsely packed niche spaces, broadly non-overlapping associations, and there's no a priori reason to believe that there is any reason why you get one associated with another. Um, it seems to be fairly arbitrary. It's not just those things. If we look at other genes as well, here we've got uh, one involved in the digestion of glucans, another in the uptake of raffinose. Again, we get these sparsely packed niche spaces, broadly non-overlapping associations, and potentially arbitrary associations. So the genetic data, at least here, seems to be much more in line with, with what the model predicts. And if we look at uh, some data on human leukocyte antigens, so encoding the major histone compatibility complex, uh, it's involved in self and non-self recognition. Uh, these are data from a population in Pakistan. And again, we see these uh, broadly non-overlapping associations. So although this is intraspecific diversity, um, there's a, a precedence in infectious diseases that um, pathogens should tend to have different um, antigenic repertoires. So if they've got two antigens, they want those to differ from everything else that's out there, otherwise they'll experience cross immunity. So this pattern here suggests that there might be some co-structuring between human and pathogen populations. So we're co-evolving with them and each population is structuring the other in order to be non-overlapping. And it's not just that population, if we look at population from South Dakota, again, we see this general pattern of non-overlapping association. So at that point, I'm going to bring things to a close and summarize what I've said. I think I spent a fair amount of time at the beginning talking about how this, this concept of niche developed and uh, the literature as a whole. And the reason to do that, like I said, was because it's quite a messy area of the literature. There's a lot, there are lots of sometimes contradictory and confusing definitions. Um, they can be quite abstract and vague at times. Uh, but, and because of that, niche has received quite a lot of bad press. Uh, but I think even so, there are some quite general principles that we can pull out of that. We know that a, a niche must define some relationship between a species and an environment. And although definitions matter to a certain extent, it's important not to get too bogged down in those things. The more recent work has sought to, to look at how uh, the niche is effectively both environmental requirements and the impact of that species on the environment. And I spent quite a bit of time talking as well about this distinction between single and multiple resources. And while that might seem at first like a bit of a theoretical curiosity, it does have a big qualitative impact on the patterns of diversity that you end up seeing. So rather than seeing these uh, densely, regularly ordered niche uh, relationships, you end up seeing very sparse, potentially arbitrary associations between traits. And so if you have different independent adaptive radiations, you can end up seeing different species traits in those, those environments, and that can simply be driven due to stochasticity. Uh, so that's somewhere falling in the middle of neutral theory and niche theory. And then finally, I talked about you know, both some ecological and genetic data. And I think it's fair to say that the ecological data as a whole is, is lacking in this area. It is quite surprising that there aren't uh, more studies looking at things, say, like 
variation in nest sites and variation in food source at the same time. Uh, often the data will look at um, proxies for these things. They'll look at morphological traits and say, okay, we've got variation in talon size and wingspan and beak width. All of those things might correlate with body size and ultimately they're not resources that you're competing for. You can't directly map those things back. So I think there's definitely a need there to try and uh, draw a better distinction between say, morphological traits and the, old, the things that you're actually not competing for. But the genetic data does seem at least to be much more in agreement with the theory, um, in particular in terms of bacterial data. Uh, with that, I'd just like to thank my collaborators. So Ellie and Josie were responsible for um, putting together a lot of the uh, empirical data here, and Sinatra and Kevin uh, called the manuscript with me. It's just come out in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution, so tell all your friends. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Conditions differ from what strictly neutral theory would predict. You said the, it suggests you're sort of halfway between Nietzsche and neutral. Yeah. Um, Why? So I, I would first of all confess that I'm far from an expert on neutral theory. Uh, so neutral theory, you would predict that those, essentially there would be no intrinsic differences between those species and they would just sort of jitter around. So those simulations that I showed in like a 2D plane, they just end up jittering around into whatever random places, effectively taking a random walk. Um, whereas the theory here is saying that you are going to end up with broadly non-overlapping associations. So if you looked in each of those dimensions in the simulations I showed, they were non-overlapping in each of those things, whereas neutral theory would say you'd end up with, um, you could end up with non-overlaps, but it would be... But we, whether or not there's overlap depends on how you define the boundaries between large and small, or um, yes. the, the, how you define the niches. Yes, exactly. I mean, in those cases, uh, in terms of the modeling, those were all done continuously, so there is no mm -hmm. obvious, uh, there's no discretization going on there. Obviously, in reality, you would try to you would bin things and try to discretize them. Again, yes, it, it comes down to how you define those things. You see, you don't want to end up with people yeah. putting things into bins that they shouldn't be put into, uh, just to try and say that there is no overlap. But yeah, that's an important point. It seems to me you're treating the uh, entities as if they're all independent and equal. Uh, but in fact, one of the real lessons from the anomalous is that phylogeny is important and history counts. Mm -hmm. So where does history come into your uh, analysis? So in terms of uh, the anomalous, as far as I'm going go back, as far as I'm aware in this study, uh, I don't think they found any evidence of phylogeny playing a role here. In terms of, well, I can't speak, uh, because I did not pull this data together myself, I can't be 100% sure in terms of the role in general. Uh, in terms of these sorts of simulations, effectively we're talking about these trajectories here, these grey dots, these are your phylogenetic history, if you like. So, obviously, there's a relationship between these species here, they have this shared uh, history and they branched at this point here. Likewise with these other species, we can trace them back in an evolutionary history sort of sense. Uh, so phylogeny obviously, obviously does play a role in how these things end up. So although we end up with arbitrary associations, as these species evolve, um, you're going to end up seeing overlaps during their evolution. Um, but eventually we're expecting them to separate and the things that they end up, or the niches that they end up occupying um, will be related to each other in some respect. So these guys here, they both specialize on fairly small seed sizes and fairly high nest sites. So we should expect some phylogenetic relationship here. Does that make sense? Well, I'm, for example, I've, I've been concerned with uh, community structure mm -hmm. in tropical and temperate zone amphibians, and in, in particular with salamanders. But there's one real stopper in this, because in the tropics, there are no amphibians within the clade I'm studying that have aquatic larvae, whereas aquatic larvae is a major component of, of niche relationships of the North Temperate 
So they're, they're, they, they aren't equivalent in that sense. The, the, the units mm -hmm. lose equivalence because of the history. Yeah, I guess the thing here with all of these, these simulations and what I'm really talking about here is sympatric um, speciation here and maintenance of sympatric diversity as opposed to cross environments. So that gets a little bit more uh, complicated in terms of comparing uh, species from different environments. Um, but I do, yeah, I take your point. It's, it's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting case. So th th this is really nice. I was just thinking about um, the, the analysis again. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the development of, of, of these discrete sets of ecomorphs <coughs> is really quite rare. And I think, I mean, thinking about the comparison between the ecomorphs and the dewlaps, I mean, th those are really pretty different kinds of things going on there. And so, um, I mean, you, one, you have sexual selection, one's really natural selection. So thinking within, within the ecomorphs, there, there are really very few that, that, uh, that groups of organisms mm -hmm. that show this kind of pattern. Mm -hmm. um, I work on spiders in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and there's, there's certain groups that, that show this there. But there are certain groups that are very close related that do not. And so it would be, I mean, I was just thinking that it would make a really interesting comparison to look at situations where you do get these kinds of phenomena. And the sister lineage, for example, that on the mainland where you get a radiation and it does not show the, the parallel evolution of ecomorphs. Likewise, in the spiders, you get one lineage that does show it, mm -hmm. one that doesn't, that is the sister lineage. So it might be interesting to look at the, the kinds of situations where you, where you do get the predictability and others where you don't. Yeah, I mean, like I said, from, from my own fairly limited uh, delve into the ecological literature to try and find examples of um, these non-overlapping niches or just in general when you've got two types of things. One of the reasons I ended up with this slightly bizarre example was because other than the bees, <coughs> yeah, it was very difficult to find any uh, reliable data that we could try and map in these ways. Uh, so I completely agree, like, there's definitely a need to try and expand into more systems, try and understand what these patterns do actually represent reality or not. But what about uh, fish, or cichlids in particular? So you get this independent evolution of benthic and limnetic, and then all these other feeding specializations, and then layered on top of that, uh, you have things like dewlaps, you have color variation yep. that's driven by sexual selection. Mm. Does it does it fill this this sort of niche space space more completely than cichlids are not one thing that we've looked at yet, but it's something definitely to look at. Yeah. And and, and you see that benthic limnetic mm -hmm. thing arising not just in cichlids but in lots of lots of fish. I mean lake white fish and sticklebacks and it seems to be a common pattern. Yeah, definitely stick <coughs> um, yeah, cichlids are definitely one to look at, yeah. yeah. So <coughs> what about the in the long history of trying to understand competition in the niche, there, there were a number of periods of sort of pushback mm -hmm. about these general ideas. And um, one had to do with just how often resources are actually limited yep. so that they would even select for the differences that you're trying to understand. Mm -hmm. And then the second is understanding, you know, the ghost of competition. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this then developed in the ideas that maybe some of these aren't giving us very good testable predictions. So how is your work yielding for us good testable predictions that we could assail with data that's probably there? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah that's a great question. So in terms of that, this is a great example of what you just said there in terms of whether certain resources really are that limiting in this system. It doesn't seem to be like file sources are particularly limiting. That's a great example of that. Um, in terms of testable predictions, you know, I've, I've shown data here that are in some ways consistent with the kinds of things that I'm predicting, the idea that we should expect to see much fewer species than one would naively assume if you just tallied up all possible species in any particular environment, and also that in different adaptive radiations, if you're able to find them, that you should end up with uh, potentially different species within those. Obviously, there's brought up as a, an issue of phylogenetic history if you've got species migrating from one island to another you'd expect them to be uh, more similar than not. Uh, so there's this general idea of sparsity as opposed to very densely um, populated niche spaces so thinking of ideas of species richness there. Um, 
a general sense of non-overlapping associations. Again here, so we've got those, most of these things are non-overlapping. With GLAPs it might not be the case. It could be down to just chance because there's so many different ways of generating them, so it's important to take into account those things. Um, but overall, you'd, and again here there's an overlap, again overall you'd expect elements of sparsity, non-overlapping associations, and if you were able to look at independent adaptive radiations, you'd expect to see more often than not arbitrary associations. So you wouldn't expect to see the same things popping up in different environments. So, for example, if you saw, um, if you always saw the same sort of dewlap and ecomorph coming up together, that would be suggestive that maybe these things are linked and they're not so arbitrary after all. So I think there are a few general predictions here. I think it's important to say that, like with any model, these are very, very simple models. They're about as basic as you get, can get in terms of, of uh, coming up with sort of evolutionary predictions. And in reality, there, there are going to be lots more complex things that would feed in there. So if we think about metapopulation structure, immigrations, gene flow, and so on, that's going to influence um, these associations. It might break down that non-overlapping association if you've got lots of immigration coming in. Um, I think, like I say, I think there are some general predictions that the ideas of sparsity, non-overlapping, and arbitrary associations that could be pulled out. Okay, well, let's thank Ben for a great talk.